Okay, so today we will have a flipped online discussion of sterile insect technique. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can shout them out or write them in the chat. So sterile insect technique, right? The idea is you get males, you make them sterile. And the whole premise is, say you have a, a wild population of insects, okay, here. And let's call, let's make males um, green dots. And let's say females are this symbol. So if you have a wild population, sterile insect technique in its simplest form is you create sterile males, you raise a bunch of them, and you release them into this population. And if you only release a few, not much is going to happen because the females are going to randomly mate and they might mate with a few sterile males. But by and large, not much is going to happen unless you release an overwhelming amount of males that are sterile. And then if you do that, all the females just by probability are mostly going to choose sterile males. Okay. And then what happens when the sterile male mates with a female, their offspring either die or are never laid as eggs. So if you look at like graphs where the Y axis would be number of individuals in a population over time, if you do sterile insect technique, you will see curves that look like this. And you can actually eradicate, that says eradicate. <laughs> you can actually eradicate insect populations via this method. Okay, so this is like a really cool, really important method that actually works. And there's four things about this that you need. And I will ask this on the test. So I'm going to say like, what are the four things you need to implement sterile insect technique? Okay. The first thing you need is uh, a means of mass rearing the insect. Okay. So in most situations, there is literally a building like a factory that gets made to, for the sole purpose of mass rearing insects. So you can imagine sterile insect technique is not typically going to be something that like the average just person does. These are usually like instituted by governments or they're giant sort of like health organization um, undertakings because you need a lot of infrastructure. Okay, so the example in the lecture is um, in Panama, there is actually a factory that the USDA owns that mass produces sterile male screw worms. Okay, so that's the first thing you need. You need a giant means of manufacturing insects. Second thing you need is you need a means of sex exclusion, or you might say selection, or you might say discrimination. Okay. So there's different ways to do this. With the screw worm, you can get lucky because, um, and, and this is true for the mosquitoes, certain life stages show sexual dimorphism. So for instance, in mosquitoes, in the pupal stage, the pupae kind of look like this. And males are a little bit smaller 
and females are a little bit fatter. So what you saw in those videos, right, was like these two essentially like glass plates. And these glass plates are connected by screws, okay? And you can tighten these screws, which closes the glass plates, okay? And if you close it to just the right amount, you can get it so most of the males pass through, but the females get stuck. And you can use this to isolate males because the males will just pass through and then you just kill the females, okay? So this is one means of excluding or discriminating the sexes, selecting them out in mosquitoes. There's other ways to do this, and I'm gonna get into that, um, but you need some mechanism to do this. There's a lot of research going into um, sex specific killing. So you might envision a scenario. Now I'm just going off the top of my head. I'm just giving you sort of like an example that somebody might be working on. You might be able to engineer this if say you had a certain gene X that was only expressed in females. Imagine you have a female gene X, maybe it's on the female chromosome. And so it's essentially got like a female specific promoter. You could steal that promoter And you could rig it into something that kills a new gene that kills a killing gene, killing gene X, okay? And you're probably gonna need some other form of control. You're gonna probably have some kind of like an, an on off switch in front of that promoter, whatever that is. And then if you inserted this, into whatever insect you were working on, you could just turn on the killing mechanism and then the only thing that would survive would be the males. So this is another means to do this that some people are studying. You could also do this with alternative splicing, but essentially you need some means of excluding or discriminating the different sexes. Any questions on that? Okay. Three, you need a means of sterilization. So in the lectures, we've talked about a few. One would be Wolbachia. One would be radiation. And there's other forms of this. Um, I don't want to get into them now. We'll talk about them in a second. But these are some examples. So you need a means of sterilization. And fourth thing you need, um, a means of release. So you can imagine the difficulty with if, maybe this is a bad Florida. If here's Florida and here's like, Mexico, uh, and then South America, I don't know, something like this. And Panama is down here. You can imagine how difficult that was um, when they eradicated screwworm to start here, okay, and push it all the way out. And this might've been easy. This part might've been reasonably easy, but once you get like here into like Texas, you can imagine how difficult that would be. And so what they were doing was they were literally flying airplanes, um, army airplanes, and the army was essentially like collaborating, mass producing these sterile males, and they would drop the pupae, the sterile screwworm pupae, all over the Southern United States until they finally got it pushed down. And now they control it down here where it's easy. So these are the four things you need for sterile insect technique. And you can bet that I will ask this on the test. It'll just be like, name the four things and describe them. Okay. 
So let's expand on this idea a little bit more. Um, and let's talk about current applications of SIT. I love teaching this topic because it's kind of like one of entomology's really, really successful stories. Um, and it works and it's worked multiple times and it's worked multiple times with different organisms. So it's a great technique. So in terms of the screw worm, there's two sort of like big known cases of this. One is the one I talk about, which is the eradication from North America. There's actually a second time that this was done in Libya. Okay, so I'm not gonna do well in geography, but if, if say this is Africa, if this is the Mediterranean Sea, Libya is like somewhere up here, I'm like Northern Africa. And there was a bad shipment um, that Libya got that was infested with screw worm. And Libya essentially had an outbreak of screw worm. Okay. And because we knew how to eradicate this, I, we, in terms of like humanity, they were able, also able to get rid of that second outbreak in Libya through the sterile insect technique. So there's essentially two replicates of screw worm eradication with sterile insect technique. Okay. So it's not just one time, it's duly replicated. Um, let's also talk about medflies. So let me go to Google here. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen these. There's two different kinds of fruit flies. There's Drosophila fruit flies, and then there's Mediterranean fruit flies, which are tephridids. They look like this. These are really bad pests of fruit. Um, and they're a really big agricultural problem, these Mediterranean fruit flies. Okay, so the, tita, the, the common name med flies, or you'll also see um, their species name, which is Ceratitis capitata. They are dipterans, which means they're flies. And uh, they are another classification of them is tephrid. I call them tephridids. So these are interesting because the USDA has like a running program of SIT against medflies. So if you look at like California, imagine this is like the California coast. Okay. Uh, California's got a bunch of ports and they get a lot of shipments of different fruits and things like that. And there will be inspections on these fruits to search for medflies. And it has happened multiple times that a bad shipment comes in and is infested with medflies, which then outbreak in a region of California. Okay. And when that happens, the USDA has like a response team. Okay. So the USDA has mechanisms of preparing sterile male medflies and they make them and they bring them to the area and they release them all around the outbreak region until they can push back the outbreak to eradication. This is like an ongoing thing. It happens, it's, it's pretty common. So it's kind of interesting. There's all kinds of things that, that people do. You don't even know that they're doing them. Um, and this is one of them, okay. This is also interesting. There's more we're talking about this. Um, one of the questions in situations like this is you really want, you would really want to know where the flies or contaminated shipments come from. 
Okay. So imagine you collected some tephridids. How would you figure out where they were from? That's a question. I want you guys to either write in the chat or say something. Like, how would you try to figure out? You're, 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 you're the USDA. You're working for the USDA. And somebody says, figure out where these contaminated shipments are coming from. Um, and you might, not, you might not be able to trace back to the actual shipment. Okay, You might just have like the source fly. How can you figure out from the fly where the flies are coming from? Different populations will have specific differences within their genomes. Yes, exactly. Very good. So, so one of the things that the USDA does is they go around all the world, okay, and they sequence genomes of Mediterranean fruit flies. And you can imagine, just as was said, in different islands, in different geographical spaces, you're going to find various SNPs in the genomes, single nucleotide polymorphisms. And there's going to be situations where, say, perhaps med flies from uh, Italy have X, Y, Z combination of SNPs. And perhaps med flies from Asia have W, A, C SNPs. These are just examples. Okay. And perhaps um, from Hawaii. I'm just making this up. There is a strange T H E combination. Okay. So we've got like a database of medfly genomes from different parts of the world. And so if you have a situation in California where you collect some new infecting or infesting Mediterranean fruit flies and you want to know where they came from. You sequence their genome, so that would be like Illumina, high throughput sequencing, okay? And you look for these SNPs, and you do some alignments, and you can figure out, imagine it was closest to, imagine the, the thing that you found was closest to Italy. It had the XYZ SNPs. Then you would start to think, okay, what are we importing from Italy? What fruits are we importing? We need to like pay better attention to things that are coming from Italy. Okay. That would be like an example of how you could use molecular biology to track this. Some like investigative work where these things are coming from um, during or after your sterile insect technique implementation. So these are things that are ongoing. Another interesting thing I, I saw this today. This is really interesting. In the medflies, um, sometimes the sterilization, and this is a big problem. Okay, this is a this is one of the main problems with getting this to work. Is sometimes the process of sterilization lowers the fitness. Okay, so you if you imagine, did I erase it? If you imagine this scenario, there's certain situations where you would. If the red males are sickly, the females can tell that there's something wrong with them and they don't mate with them. Okay. So that's called mate discrimination. And this happens. And this is one thing that can contribute to sterling sick technique not working is if you're reducing the fitness of the males and flies. I, actual fruit flies like Drosophila, they actually have like a mating dance and they like tap each other's abdomens and there's a special like dance. So if you're not fit and you can't like do those mating behaviors, females won't mate with you. Okay, so that's a problem. Um, and one way you can overcome that, at least in the med flies, what people are researching is called aroma therapy. This is funny. <laughs> so what they do, is they make some sterile males and they get some smelly compounds that females like, okay? So you can imagine like maybe like some pheromones or maybe like some pleasant like fruit things that the female thinks is like smells good. 
and they will treat the males with essentially like attractive odors. And that can sort of like increase their fitness a little bit. Okay, so if you have a situation where you you have to sterilize them and maybe that lowers them their fitness a little bit, you can resort to this aromatherapy. You can treat the males with attractive odors and that can sometimes compensate for the loss of fitness advantage in the sterilization because more females will be attracted to them. That's one thing that's, that's interesting that's being done with the med flies. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then we also talked, okay, so there's different, there's different applications of this, right? Screwworm, med flies. The other situation with which people use sterile insect technique or sterile insect technique-like techniques is with mosquitoes. Okay, and a problem with mosquitoes for the longest time was that mosquitoes aren't, don't do well under radiation. Okay, so if you take radioactive cobalt like they did with the screwworm and you shoot some radioactive radioactivity, gamma rays or whatever, alpha particles, I don't know what it is with the cobalt, but you shoot the cobalt 60 at them, they get sick. Okay, so males, male mosquitoes do not do well under radiation. So people have always tried to figure out different ways through which they could do the sterilization in mosquitoes to make this work. Okay, and now we are familiar with some of them. One would be Wolbachia. And when Wolbachia is used for the sterile insect technique, they give this a special name, which is called IIT to discriminate it from the sterile insect technique. This one is classically considered to be where you, ster you sterilize with radiation. Okay. IIT is incompatible insect technique. So this is where you are infecting with Wolbachia. And remember, we went through the entire process of teaching you how Wolbachia can sterilize the sperm, that's effectively sterile insect technique, okay? What you worry about in this situation is the population that you're releasing these sterile males into, it's best if they don't have Wolbachia because you can imagine if the population you were releasing them into had Wolbachia, they might have rescue factors, which could make this not work. Okay, and that actually is, it, it's a little bit more nuanced than that, but that's one thing that you, you think about or you worry about when people are doing that. Um, and then there's a third way which, with which people are implementing um, sterile insect technique sort of with mosquitoes, which is called the riddle system. Okay. And Riddle is run or owned by a company called Oxitech, which was an English company. And I think it's been purchased it, now. I think it's owned by a larger subsidiary, um, but it was originally Oxitech. They invented what are called the Riddle mosquitoes. Okay. So what do you remember about the Riddle mosquitoes from the lecture? How did, what, what does Riddle stand for? They have dominant lethal genes. Yeah, it stands for release of insects with dominant lethal riddle. Clever. Um, so this is not really sterile insect technique, but it kind of is. Why is it not sterile insect technique mechanistically? Somebody write it in the chat. Why is it not sterile insect technique? Yes. It's not sterile insect technique because it's not, it's not, it's not sterilizing sperm. 
What it is, is it's killing larvae. Okay, so the way that this works is they take a gene, let's just call it DL, dominant lethal. What is a dominant? What does dominant lethal mean? What does that mean mechanistically? Dominant lethal. Let's see some participation here, some diversity and participation. Write it in the chat. What does dominant lethal mean? Come on, work with me here. Help me out. It's like blues clues. Yes, but it means more than that. Um, so the comment was, if they get it, they die. Yes, but it also means more than that. It means it kills at heterozygous, I guess you'd say a level. It, it doesn't need to be homozygous, right? So mosquitoes are diploid. They get one gene from, they get one set of chromosomes from their mom and one set of chromosomes from their dad. Okay, just like us. And if they just get one copy of the DL, that's enough to kill them. So they only need to be heterozygous, okay? You can imagine this will not work if, this wouldn't work if the dominant lethal was not quote unquote dominant, okay? If it was recessive lethal, this would not work because the way that this works is they genetically modify a male, they release it. The male mates with a wild type, female. They make offspring, which are heterozygous for whatever he had and heterozygous for whatever she had. It's a mix, right? Set of chromosomes from dad, set of chromosomes from mom. So there's no way to get homozygous or homozygous or yeah, homozygous sort of like transgene copies. There's a way to do that, which is would be gene drive, which we will talk about later. But that's actually a really difficult topic in biotech is essentially like creating wild homozygous transgenes, like in the wild, getting them to become homozygous, that's actually really hard. So this, this would not work unless it was a dominant lethal, which means it kills at the heterozygous level. That's an important point. Okay, so the way that this works is they take a dominant lethal and this gene, it's actually a gene called TTAB and you don't need to know these details. I'm just doing this because this is interesting because they are releasing these in Miami. You might actually like, actually, sorry, Florida Keys. Florida Keys. If you see like in the news, oh, releasing genetically modified organisms in the Florida Keys. That's what this is. So you might actually kind of like want to know what this is. It's this gene called TTAV. Um, and essentially what they claim it is, is they claim it's a global transcriptional repressor. So what does that mean? How does it kill? Blue's Clues in the chat. How does it kill mechanistically? I mean, I wrote it all out. There's not, not a trick here. Transcriptional repressor, right? It shuts off transcription. Repressor turned off. Hmm. Essentially, okay, so the, the way that it kills is this thing is like a transcription factor, but it works on everything and it's a repressor. So it just like, according to what they say in their, in their like, EPA approval form is this thing is like a transcription factor that just binds to a whole bunch of promoters and shuts everything off. So imagine if you went into a cell and you shut off all the lights, you would kill the cell. And that's what this thing does in terms of transcription. It just shuts everything off is what they claim. Okay. So what they do
is they rig this thing up in front of a promoter. Okay. And the promoter or the regulator system is called the TET promoter. TET stands for tetracycline. Tetracycline is an antibiotic. And in many sort of biological biotechnology constructs, it's been engineered as kind of like a system like IPTG or Arabinose. It's essentially like a regulating molecule that can bind to a transcription factor, okay? And there are different variations of this, okay? There are TET on systems and there are TET off systems. So you can imagine in the TET on system, um, I always get this confused because this is kind of confusing. In the, in, in the way that I'm saying it, in the TET on system, it means if you have TET, your gene would be on, okay? And this one would mean if you have TET, your gene would be off, okay? So these are two, essentially what I'm telling you is there's two, there's different systems, okay? Where people have engineered this in different ways. And the riddle construct is a TET off. Okay, so the way that it works, the riddle is tet off. So they insert this into the mosquitoes and mosquitoes grow in water and their larvae look like this. They kind of like swim in the water. And in the lab, they grow these things in water where they add tetracycline, okay? So when they grow these riddle mosquitoes, the gene is off because they put tetracycline in the water. Okay, then they rear, they sex select, they, uh, they're not sterile because this is not technically sterile insect technique. And then they mass release. And then these mate, so let's draw what's happening here. Let's take a male. The male has the TED off system in front of the dominant lethal. They mate to a wild type female. Okay. And importantly, the ones that they're releasing in the wild would be homozygous. So they would have two copies of this, which means that every single one of their offspring either get this or this. So all their offspring are gonna inherit at least one tet off dominant lethal. And these eggs are gonna be growing in water in the wild, so there's gonna be no tetracycline. So now all of a sudden the gene turns on because there's no tetracycline. The dominant lethal gene gets expressed. The transcription factor gets made, shuts the lights off. Bye-bye mosquitoes. That's how this works. Are there any questions on that? Is the promoter only on in larvae? Or does it have a lag time? Um, that's interesting. I think, I think according to my readings, I don't think it kills them in the first instar. So you have to know about insects to know what I'm talking about here. Um, insects have, Insects go through when they grow. Insects can't grow past their exoskeleton size because it's like a hard shell. So they have what are called molts, okay? Where they shed their exoskeleton and then a new bigger organism comes out. That's molting. So larvae, insect larvae have a few instars. Oh, I'm gonna embarrass myself. I think it's like four instars. 
I have to Google this. Because somebody's going to watch this and they're going to get mad at me. One, two, three, four. <laughs> I was right. Four in stars. Woo, woo. Okay. Uh, <laughs> four in stars. So that means there's like a little larvae, a bigger larvae, a bigger larvae, and then a final larvae before they pupate, before they become adult mosquitoes. And I think the Oxytech kills them at the third instar. I think do you have again fact check me on this. Um, so the answer to your question is I think there is a lag. There is a lag. Um, I don't think it turns on until and fully does the killing until the later instar. So I think I can answer that question, but you might want to fact check that because it could be. I know it doesn't. I know for a fact it's not killing in the first instar. But it could, it, it might be either the second, the third, or the fourth. I think it's the third in star. Okay. Any other questions? How does it not kill the adults out of the water? Oh, that's an interesting question. My guess. Um, so, so the question is, you're rearing them in the water. Imagine you have plus tetracycline. The pupae pupate in the water um, and then they emerge as adults and the question is why doesn't it kill the adults and okay this is a conjecture this is a hypothesis hypothesis for why the adults aren't dead in the plus debt system is because they probably have residual tet in their system which is enough to hold it off for a while. But that's a really good question. You'd have to deeply like look into the genetic mechanisms of this to answer that question. It's a really good question. This would be one hypothesis. It may or may not be true. Um, definitely something the EPA should be looking into for sure. Okay, that's riddle. Um, Let's talk about IIT a little bit more. Because IIT is being released in Miami, right next door, and in California with 80s, a gypti, and I think they're also doing it with albopictus. Certainly in China, they're doing it with albopictus. So this is very, very popular. Wolbachia mediated sterility to do sterile insect technique. It's popular. Um, and the issue with this, the issue that you worry about with IIT, as we discussed just a little bit, I hinted at before, is if you are making a factory, okay, and your factory is producing Wolbachia infected males. One of the things that you worry about is Wolbachia infected females being released. And the reason you worry about that is because CI is controlled by a TA system, the toxin and an antidote. And if you are releasing females, that have Wolbachia, which have this antidote, you are releasing the antidote into the population, okay? And if you do that, you are doing something different, okay? So let me draw out two scenarios. I'll try to do this slow. In one scenario, you have no contamination. There's no Wolbachia plus females. Okay. So you release the sterile males. There's some wild males, some wild females. In this situation, the curve of number of individuals is going to look like this. 
That's good. That's what we want to see. If, if you have contamination at some, not high percent, but some non-zero percent with Wolbachia infected females, you have contamination at a non-zero percentage, okay? And you release what looks like this. What is gonna happen? Do you see, write it in the chat. Do you understand what's gonna happen? What is gonna happen? What's the problem here? Yes, they will mate with each other and have offspring. Now what you're gonna see is you're gonna see what's called population replacement. CI is going to kick in. CI is a form of gene drive. And so you're not gonna get population suppression. You're gonna get what's called population replacement. Population replacement. So you're gonna suppress the old population and you're gonna replace it with a new one. And the new one is going to be infected by Wolbachia. And now you have given away all the keys to your lock and your Sterlinsek technique will never work again. Okay. So this is, this is what people worry about with IIT is if you're doing, if, if you're doing IIT, you don't want this to happen. Okay. So there are some strategies with which to combat this um, from happening, okay? So Verily, which is a company owned by Google, what they do is what you saw in the movie. They have giant machine cameras that release the mosquitoes into a tube and they take a picture and they have a machine learning algorithm determine, is this a male or a female? And then they can pass that specimen to another tube and do it again, pass it to another tube, do it again. And then when they're certain, they can put that one into say the collection of males or the collection of females, okay? And through their machine learning, plus robotics, robotic sorting. They can reduce the error rate to essentially like one in a billion. Okay. So Google has essentially like solved that problem with robotic sorting and machine learning. In China, they do it differently. In Guangzhou, China, they do it differently. What they do is they use um, size-based sorting, which is what you saw when you saw the glass planes, okay? And then what they do is they take their population of sorted males and they bolus them with radiation. So they're combining IIT plus sterile insect technique. And the trick is, the catch here is, if you were paying attention, you heard me say that radiation makes them less fit. The trick here is they only give them a tiny dose of radiation. And the interesting thing is that females versus males, females are more 
susceptible to radiation, okay? So if they give them a tiny dose of radiation, that's enough to sterilize the contaminants. So the important thing to point out here, which people don't always understand when I explain this, this IIT plus SIT technique, they're not double dosing the males to like make them double sterile. The Wabakia are enough to make the males completely sterile. The reason they add in the radiation is to sterilize the tiny amount of contaminating females. Okay, and then when they release these, there's no danger of population replacement because all these females are also sterilized by radiation. So those are the two ways in which um, you can address this problem. Any questions? If you thought this was interesting, I do have a lecture on Riddle in Miami in my medical veterinary entomology class. And I, in my biotechnology playlist, I have an entire hour, 50 minute lecture on SIT plus IIT, which looks at the paper that discusses that. So if you're interested in that, you can look at it, but um, everything I've discussed in here will probably be stuff I might put on the test not extra stuff that was in those lectures. Okay, so let me shut this recording off. I have a question uh, now that they're recording's off. <laughs> wait, wait, okay.